Jesus' famous soundbite, love your enemies, probably amounts to, at one and the same time, the most admired as well as the least practiced piece of teaching in history. Instead, the idea that still thrives is that the best way to get the outcome we're looking for, either personally or globally, is to flex our muscles and to teach them, whoever they happen to be, a lesson or two. You only have to watch the TV or go to the cinema to see just how this idea fascinates us and dominates our worldview. From True Grit to Die Hard, Rambo to Batman, and even Popeye to Tom and Jerry. What has been called the myth of redemptive violence plays a central role in our culture. He who has the biggest guns wins. And to add irony to injury, James Bond, the British spy, in the service of queen and country, kills, murders, threatens, bullies, seduces, commits adultery, lies, steals, cheats, breaks the law and beats his enemies to a pulp. All to protect our Western Christian civilization. We're repeatedly sold what I believe is a lie, that the use of aggression and violence is the only way to win and to eradicate the enemy. We teach it to our children, it pervades their worldview. And while Jesus' famous advice about forgiveness and non-violence is dismissed as impractical idealism, extraordinarily no such charge is ever made against violence in spite of the fact that history has proved time and time again that war, hostility and aggression solve nothing in the long run. To put it differently, you can't kill your way to peace. Guns can win a truce, but never genuine peace. In this, they are impotent. Perhaps the ultimate weakness of any kind of violence is that it's a descending spiral, begetting the very thing that it seeks to destroy. Violence can never stop violence simply because every successful violent act deepens our faith in it, and this very success leads others to imitate it. As Gandhi once said, I object to violence because even when it appears to do good, the good it does is only temporary, the evil it does is permanent. So how have we been so deluded by this destructive myth of redemptive violence? When Jesus first announced that part of his new agenda for life was loving enemies, which you can read all about in Matthew's Gospel chapter 5, he could not have made a more controversial statement. At the time, not only was Israel under the Roman rule and its occupying forces universally hated by everyone, but popular homegrown Judean groups such as the Zealots or Dagger Men as they were sometimes known committed to the cause of bloody revolution had captured the imagination of countless Jewish people. The violent overthrow of the Romans seemed to many to be the most obvious solution to rid their land of this evil empire which was itself built on military strength. But Jesus was determined to tackle this disastrous false belief that true liberation and sustained freedom could ever be achieved as the result of the power that violence gives to a person or a nation. And so it was that for the first few centuries of its life the church was well known for its determined stance against all aggression or violence as a tool to achieve either personal or nationalistic aims. As 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 made clear to the first followers of Christ, do not repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do and he will bless you for it. But this commitment was no wishy-washy, inactive, cowardly, weak knee, lay down and die pacifism. Instead, it sprang from a deep understanding of Jesus' teaching and example, especially that of his death and resurrection. As not about the enduring anger of God, which somehow had to be satisfied, but rather about Jesus' choice to live in line with his own teaching, to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to lay down his rights and not to return evil for evil. 
Though oppressed and afflicted, Jesus did not fight back. Blessed are the peacemakers, he's taught instead, for they will be called the children of God. Instead of calling down fire on those who persecuted him, Jesus chose to soak up the anger, hostility and the self-centeredness of the Jewish religious establishment. He soaked up the brutality of the Roman regime, the indifference of the crowd and the cowardice of his own followers. The cross is the clearest demonstration of God's self-giving love but still the might is right myth of redemptive violence continues to pervade our culture, the culture of huge sections of the church and the thinking of many Christians. Why? Well, in my view, it's largely because of the fundamentally flawed but persistent idea that the cross, the central symbol of Christianity, presents God as violent and vengeful. And that sends a message to all those who cling to this understanding and regard themselves as agents of this God that aggressive behaviour, rejection and sometimes even outright violence is a legitimate response to those they regard as sinful. But of course, as I've said before, if the cross really is about God's need to have his pent-up anger pacified through violence, then Jesus' teaching around loving and forgiving our enemies without counting the cost seems to be in direct conflict with God's own character and practice. So the challenge before us is to articulate for a new generation a different narrative. A narrative that's powerful enough to bring real and lasting peace to our vulnerable, multicultural, multi-faith world, as well as to our local communities and personal relationships. It's not enough to talk about peace. It's not enough to believe in peace. The real task, the only task, is to work at peace. And in my view, the greatest example of exactly that is the cross of Christ. As Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. I'll leave you with a couple of questions. Does what we believe about the cross make a difference to the way we behave? And if so, how should we tell the story of that cross?